Salesforce is an incredibly powerful tool, but it can be hard to sift through all of the data to better understand the next best course of action or to identify historical trends. Einstein is changing the way organizations interact with their data by making it easy to find insights and take action. In this podcast interview, Marco Casalena shares some of the remarkable ways that AI has revolutionized how businesses interact with their data in a Salesforce environment. Welcome to the Brainy 8 Show, where we talk about all things Salesforce, sharing the coolest features, solutions, and best practices to turn you into a Salesforce rock star. Here's your host, former attorney turned Salesforce consultant and trainer, David Giller. Businesses are looking for new ways to improve customer satisfaction, increase profits, and provide better service. Salesforce Einstein is a unique tool that gives organizations an incredible advantage in accomplishing all of these goals. Einstein provides companies with important insights into their data, allowing them to make well-informed decisions about their own company. This interview with Marco Casalena will explore how Einstein is currently being used in a variety of use cases and industries. Buckle up because you're about to go on a wild ride into the future with some fantastic AI superpowers. Marco Casalena is a senior vice president of product management at Salesforce, where he is the general manager of Einstein, Salesforce's AI system. He was previously vice president of applications at Ring Central, where he ran Ring Central's contact center and collaboration business units. This is Marco's second stint at Salesforce. During his first term at Salesforce, from 2005 to 2010, he was one of the original developers of the Service Cloud product and then its product manager. Marco, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I am doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I am thrilled to have you here. And I am also excited to have you shed some light on all things Einstein. But before we get into Einstein, can you give folks a little bit of a background on who you are and how long you've been in the Salesforce ecosystem and what you're doing today at Salesforce? 16 years, man. 16 years. I started at Salesforce in August of 2005. And Back then, I was one of the original developers of what's now known as the Service Cloud. You might have heard of it, <laughs> biggest product Salesforce has today. Back then, it was nothing yet. So I was one of the original developers and then one of the product managers at the Service Cloud. And I left Salesforce in 2010, but the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I left Salesforce, I was still in the Salesforce ecosystem. And I went to this company that was doing machine learning, but they didn't really know what they were going to do it for yet then. Mm -hmm. And myself, a couple other ex-Salesforce guys were out there. And uh, we came up with this idea, this idea that having come from Salesforce, we're like, what if we did machine learning in Salesforce? What if we use the data? People are putting a lot of data in Salesforce and there are a lot of outcomes in Salesforce outcomes being like lead conversions, deals, closing, those kinds of things. What if we did machine learning there? And so we started doing that and it was pretty successful for us actually at this little startup that we had, it was like 60 people. And then we got acquired by SAP. They didn't know what to do with us, honestly, that's if you didn't know it. So we all went our separate ways, but eventually Salesforce decided to get serious about artificial intelligence and machine learning and stuff. And then we reconvened. So those of us who had left and we came back and I came back to lead product originally for Einstein and then became GM in 2019. So I've now been GM of Einstein for some years and we have been cracking away at Einstein and still. I think a lot of people don't really know what it is, what it does, whether it's real, whether it's marketing. Exactly. So hopefully we can talk about some of that stuff today. Yes. So let's dive right in. And so my first question is for those Salesforce professionals who haven't yet had a chance to experience Einstein, what is it exactly? All right. Einstein is definitely a thing. Back in 2017, you could be forgiven for thinking that it was just the fluffy Einstein dude dancing on stage or whatever, but today it is absolutely real. Einstein is AI for Salesforce. It is a very specific thing. There are lots of AI toolkits out there from Databricks and on AWS, you have Sage, Azure ML, and 
data robot. There's, there's all of these things. There's hundreds of them actually. And of course you could use the open source ones, Python and R and stuff, but Einstein is not any of those things. It's not like those things. It's different. It is specifically for Salesforce. It's meant to be used on the data that's in Salesforce, the people entrust to Salesforce. It's meant to be used by Salesforce users. So we specifically design Einstein such that uh, a Salesforce user can understand that it's part of what they're doing anyway in sales cloud and service cloud and marketing cloud and commerce cloud, that it's just there and it's consistent with what they already know. And I always say that we design Einstein to be configured by a Salesforce administrator. Somebody who doesn't know an algorithm from a log should be able to set up any Einstein thing. And today there were like 51, as I was saying, this is, today is the day also that we're recording this. This is the day of the new release of the, which release, this is winter 22 release. Congratulations. And there's Einstein things that I've lost count of how many there are. And i like 54 or 56, but there's a lot of Einstein things that are live today across every cloud. So Einstein is artificial intelligence that's made to be native within Salesforce to feel organic for a Salesforce admin. So it's not meant for someone who has some higher degree in data analytics or in artificial intelligence. So I guess to try to make it a little bit more tangible for someone who is new to Einstein, my question is, how are some companies currently using Einstein in order to revolutionize their operations? All right, let's break it down a little bit. The first and most accessible Einstein thing today is Einstein search. If you're using light, because Einstein search only runs in lightning, but if you're using yep. lightning, please turn on Einstein search. There are tens of thousands of businesses and governments that have already turned it on. This thing just went GA like in June and it is massively popular and it's popular because it totally works. Einstein search presents a different interface for the search box up at the top. Up to this point, that search box has always been like keyword. And so you type in something, you type in Parker Harris and you get Parker Harris, right? But Einstein search makes it so that it's natural language based. So I can't, it's not that I just type Parker Harris. I could be like Parker Harris's open opportunities this month. And it will make a list view on the fly of Parker Harris's open opportunities this month with the proper filters and all that stuff. And the funny thing is that I'm also an org admin for a nonprofit, right? And I turned it yeah. on for them and instantly they started using it. They don't even think about it. Type in John Smith's donations this month and bam, there's John Smith's donations this month. Once it's there, you, you don't even notice it anymore. And actually that's consistent with the Einstein philosophy overall, actually, is the idea of Einstein is that it should be there helping you out. And most of the time you don't even need to know that it's there. It's just doing its thing. Like Siri on your phone, if you use an iPhone, it just does a bunch of stuff. And that's the way Einstein is. So. Search is a universal thing. I definitely recommend a lot of people look into that because it is foundational to what Salesforce is. Quick question. Yeah. With Einstein search, does that cost anything extra? No, it doesn't cost anything extra. No. As of now, it is the default experience in Lightning, actually. So if you're just now upgrading to Lightning, it'll be like, hey, Einstein search is here now. And it's here. Search. And incidentally, I should note that the natural language piece of it is just a part of it. Einstein search is actually a, a, a three-part thing where it does natural language search like I described. But it also does, let's say that I'm searching John Smith and there's 500 John Smiths in my org. So how does it know which is the, which is the one that I'm actually looking for? Which is the one right. that I put up? It's using machine learning in the background also to determine like, you are most likely to click on this John Smith for That's whatever cool. reason that might be because you own that account or because you clicked mm -hmm. on it before or whatever it might be. So it will re-rank the search results according to what you are actually most likely to click on. Both the objects and the rows with records. Records, mm -hmm. yeah. And by the way, the third piece of it is the actionable thing where a search mm -hmm. box is not a search box. You can literally do stuff mm -hmm. in there now. So we talked about, we talked about Einstein search and that's yep. a, that is like the foundational thing. Y'all have it already. Please try it out, turn it on. Let's talk about it in the different clouds, how it manifests itself. So in the sales cloud, started with that. And that was like the first Einstein that went live, by the way, was sales cloud Einstein. And we have there, we have a couple of different types of applications in there. There's the scoring type, which is like lead scoring and opportunity scoring, by the way, is available to everybody. So you could just turn that one on too. And then we have things like conversation insights, which can listen to a call and, and allow you to do a call coaching on that call. Identify moments of interest and stuff like that. It can also listen to zoom calls and things too. So not just calls, videos, but if you think about the scoring applications, for example, underlying the scoring applications, like lead score, let's just take lead scoring as an example, lead scoring. It gives you this number. So you have this number, let's say 
you get a, a, a 96, right? So what is that 96 really? Fundamentally underneath there, beneath that, beneath just about every prediction is a question. And the question here is a relatively simple yes or no question, which is yes or no, is this lead going to convert or not? And that's really what that lead score represents. When you ask a yes or no question of Einstein or really any other machine learning system in the world, you don't get a yes and no back. What you get is a probability, really. So you, it'll be like, underneath the scenes, it'll be like, this person has an X percent chance of converting. That is not actually what the lead score shows either, though. It's not showing the raw probability because if Can it I, did that, it's not exactly comport with human intuition. The thing is, most businesses convert their leads at a 5% clip. And so here you got this guy, John Smith, he comes up and, and you have a 15% chance of converting this guy. But to a human, like 15% still looks like bad odds. Even if that's like three times your average, that's good. So the score that you see is a scaled score hmm. that sort of represents the percentile that they're at. So you see a 96, that's a 96 percentile. That's one of your most likely leads to convert relative to all the others. And we show it as a 96 so that it comports with human intuition. But you think about lead scoring in particular, right? Most businesses, especially mid-size and up, already have something for lead scoring. They're using the one from the one on the app exchange that has like 10,000 installs that John Cusera wrote like in 2007. Or they're using the one from Pardot or one from Eloqua or one from Marketo or whatever. And they all have these lead scoring systems built into them. And all of them, all the legacy ones anyway, are built on rules. If you're in Kentucky, plus one. If you're in West Virginia, minus one, whatever. And the problem with that is that those rules can't possibly stay up to date. They can't be, right? Your business changes, something happens, COVID happens, whatever it is, your business changes. Fundamentally, the way that lead scoring works, it's using machine learning algorithms, but ultimately it's doing the same thing. It's using these algorithms to determine there are all these attributes that you have about the lead, what their title is and where they are and what their company is, all these things. And it's trying to divine those rules. It's trying to reverse engineer what is going on with that. That's fundamentally what machine learning really is to answer this question that you ask it, which in this case is yes or no, is this lead going to convert or not? So it's doing the same thing you would be doing manually by building these lead scoring rules in Marketo or whatever, but it does it at a, at a much higher cadence. These things rebuilt themselves like every 10 days. And so every 10 days, it's going to be like, has anything changed in your business? I'm going to try to relearn that and, and learn and rejigger these rules so that they make sense given the current business situation. So something like lead scoring, it's interesting. Like it's a little bit of a heavy lift for companies because they already have something and they're like, why would I go to this thing? And the fact is machine learning based lead scoring is better because it tends to be more up to date. Okay. So the algorithms and the data points that Einstein is looking at are all internal to that organization based on the trends that are found within the historical yes transactions making, for that company for that instance I'm making an absolutely foundational point about einstein so einstein does very little of what we call global modeling a global model is a model where you mash together data from all different businesses or whatever and you use that mashed up model to produce a result we have a few of those things, lead scoring, opportunity scoring. So if you turn those features on and you opt into it, then your data can participate in it. But the vast majority of what we do, 99.9% .9 of what Einstein is doing is individual models built solely on each customer's data set. And we're managing hundreds of thousands of individual predictive models on behalf of our customers. It's turned on these features. It's building that solely on their data. And that makes it very accurate for them. In fact, that almost always performs better than a global model possibly could because it's specific to, to that business. So yeah, for lead scoring, if you turn it on now, it can fall back on a global model in the event that you don't have enough leads. So I was just going to ask, so let's make believe from a practical perspective today, we wave the magic wand and instantly today is the first day that we're using Salesforce and we're using it with Einstein from day one, but today is day one of anyone logging in and our legacy data is already there, but it's all new to Salesforce. So yeah. what are we going to see, if anything, as well, it leads to Einstein? If you have migrated your legacy data, then it will use that data. It'll use it to, to build its model, right? So these things will tend to work. And mm -hmm. incidentally, some of these things now have uh, assessors up front that will help you decide. For example, there's a brand new, actually, sales thought assessor. We've had one for a while. We just rejiggered it uh, a couple of months ago. That will help you decide, do I have enough data for this thing to work by itself? But also, what expected benefit might we get from this based on the experience of uh, other customers that have turned this thing on? So yeah, day one, 
if you have data there, it'll work. If you don't have data there, well, some of these features just will not work because they, they need data to work. They're not magic. Makes complete sense. When it comes to something like lead scoring too, what's funny about that is people often ask, I only have a hundred leads. Can I still use lead scoring? Nowadays, the answer is actually yes, because there is a global model fallback that we use there that will do. Mm -hmm. Also, if you only have a hundred leads, call them all. Do you really need to prioritize those things? Not really. That's an excellent point. All right. So we talked about utilizing Einstein search. We talked mm -hmm. about how Einstein can be used for opportunity scoring and lead scoring. Let's talk about my old product service cloud. What I think is the coolest Einstein thing also happens to be by far the least sexy Einstein thing that we have is Einstein case classification. And people have just been waking up to this lately because when I look at the graph of like people turning on case classification, it's really hockey sticking in a big way lately. But basically it's a simple concept. It learns to read your cases and route them. That's what it does. And fundamentally what you're doing as an administrator, when you set this thing up, it's not like it's asking you like what algorithm you want to use or any of that stuff. Basically it says, what fields would you like me to set? You can pick up to 10 pick list or checkbox or lookup fields and it'll predict those fields. And you can either turn it in recommend mode where it's recommends to an agent. I think it's going to be these things, or you can turn it in full auto mode where it just sets them and routes it. And you can make it rerun assignment rules and everything to, to make it do that. But when I was in between my two stints at Salesforce, one of the places I went to was Ring Central. Yep. And at Ring Central, you had a bunch of people in Manila and all they did all day, they were reading cases. We, we were taking a vast number of cases because we had a huge number of customers. They were just reading these cases all day and routing them. This one's billing and this one's voice quality. This one's networking or whatever. And they would just be sending these cases and this is all they did. These people could have actually been providing support to the customer, but case classification can do that. It learns from your history of cases, provided you have at least a thousand cases in the last six months. It will learn to read those cases and categorize the fields that you set. And if you, you know, use that for your assignment rules, it based on that. So it's super not sexy. And in fact, in many cases, if you turn it to full auto mode, people don't even know it's running. They never see it happening. It just got routed yeah. there. All right. So let me ask you this. So when we say when the tickets come in and Einstein can classify them and route them. So the tickets are coming in as in like free form text, like an inbound email, like yep. just a loosey goosey right. text form. Exactly. That's the whole point. So yeah, if you're getting cases on email to case, you're getting it from social media, whatever it is, where it's, yeah, just free form text. And the only reliable things you have are a subject and a description. This is where case classification thrives and it can work multi-language. We have, I have a customer that has 30 different languages in here. That's incredible. So if I'm listening to this podcast, I am the manager of a customer support team dealing with tickets all day long. My team is just drowning in tickets. You're telling me that if I turn on Einstein for case management, I can have a lot of these mundane manual efforts of reviewing the cases and classifying them and routing them automatically done for me. That is exactly what I'm saying. I, furthermore, Unbelievable. I'm also saying yeah. that case classification, at least the basic version of case classification is now included in the base Salesforce like service cloud license. And so you can try it right now. If you're using service cloud, you can try this thing. And the difference between the basic and the, the paid version of it, by the way, is segmentation. So you can basically try it for one segment. And a lot of people use service cloud for different segments of their business, or they use it both internally and externally. And you can try to run it for your whole company, or you could just pick one of those segments and say, let me see if it works for this particular segment. I believe that most of you who do try it will find that it does work because it actually does work remarkably well. It's accuracy is, is remarkably high, I have to say. And so you could try it today. And if it really works for you, and it's really something that it looks like it's going to benefit your business, then you can, you know, buy up to the search thought Einstein licenses that it include multiple segments. But this is generally true of most of the Einstein things today is that they are either like search, they're just included in the base license, or there is at least a version of them that's included in the base license. Because I think one of the realizations that we had early on mm -hmm. is the difficulty with something like Einstein is you can't possibly know if it's going to work for you. There's no demo, no sandbox that's right. going to magic tell you if this is going to work for you. Right. Unless you actually try it on your own data. You can only try it on your own data. This does not work on demo data. It will puke in an instant on demo data. AI and demo data do not get along. You have to try it. And so we have to give you a mechanism by which you can try it. Love that. Let's talk about some of the myths around Einstein functionality. What do you see as some of the more common myths of the 
misconceptions of what people think Einstein either can do or can't do. Yeah, we could talk about that. One of the, one of the myths is that it's a sort of a general purpose AI toolkit like IBM Watson, and it's not. You're not going to build a self-driving car in Einstein. That is not what it's for. It's like earlier, very specifically AI for Salesforce. Now, if you have some folks that are in your audience that are data scientists or of that, you know, of that ilk and are familiar with data science tools, Einstein looks very different from those other tools. Einstein is also not SageMaker. AWS is SageMaker, for example. You're not going to pop open a Jupyter notebook in Einstein and start, you know, coding some Python and using your algorithms in there. That's not how that is, right? This is not what Einstein's about. Einstein is meant to be consistent with the Salesforce experience. And that generally means that it's declared and that you can use it in a declarative way in the same way that you use other Salesforce tools like flow and process builder and the schema stuff and all those. Yeah. So that's one thing. Another common myth, which we spelled already is that, like I said, we largely speaking, we're not like mashing together all the different orgs data right. to do this. And even on the rare occasion, when we do such a thing, you have to specifically opt into that. Mm. The vast majority of our predictions, as I said, are based solely on each business or each government's data. We have a lot of governments using Einstein now, surprisingly. It's interesting. A lot of governments using Einstein bots now, chat bots. Nice. Uh, or among governments. So uh, anyway. For so, consumer-facing applications, I presume? Consumer-facing applications. That's right. And yeah. what's really interesting is like 1% of the population of the United States had a conversation with an Einstein bot in the last oh month. God. Oh my God. Every, I did a double take. Because I see these numbers every week. We get these numbers. I get these little reports. And I was like, can you really think about that in the context of the population of the United States? When I see the number of sessions from the United States with our chatbot, it's a significant proportion. It's like, geez. that's a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people. Which is also remarkable because just imagine if we're talking about the government using it for a public facing application, mm -hmm. we're probably talking about things like getting uh, public assistance or office hours of when certain local offices are open, is garbage mm -hmm. pickup going to be on Monday, reporting a pothole kind of stuff. And those are functions that previously took a lot of people hours where people are answering phone calls. And if someone's not there after 5 p.m., it's just going to go to voicemail or go to an answering service or right. just no one is going to pick it up until nine o'clock in the morning. And this is not only taking in that issue, but also providing back the relevant information. And then to the point that you made before classifying it, routing it to where it needs to go, which is pretty incredible. Right. Or resolving it right then and there. If you go to the California DMV website, for example, and this is actually one of the more popular use cases now is these DMVs. And in the UK, it's called DVLA, but it's also their UK wide, like vehicle licensing thing. They're using our chatbot. And in many cases, it's as you said, right? I can ask a question of this thing. Oh, I lost my license. How do I get a new license? And it will answer the question right there. Click this thing, fill out this form, press send, and you get a new license. And that prevents me from having to go to the DMV and wait online or to call the DMV and wait on hold. I, as a user, I'm happier. And the DMV is happier too, because they don't have to staff for that kind of eventuality. So anyway, yeah, we have a lot of that happening now. We have, yeah, like lots and lots of businesses and governments have turned on these chatbots. To be fair, a chatbot is, is one of the heavier Einstein things to turn on. Versus case classification, you can turn that on and just try it right. tomorrow and you will see that it probably will work for most businesses. Right. A chatbot, you do have to give it some care and feeding. You have to design what are the dialogues that my customers are going to want to have with it. And more and more, we have these tools that, especially if you already have a chat channel, we have these tools that can use the transcripts of that to try to divine that for you and suggest like your customer is going to want to ask you X, Y, and Z. But that does require also ongoing care and feeding too, as you, your customers ask you more questions or they ask the chatbot a question that you didn't train it about. And then you have to tell it what to say. And I'm assuming if an organization already has an extensive knowledge base of like frequently asked questions, I'm assuming that Einstein can read through that and leverage the inputs from the web visitor to figure out which article is most appropriate. And we can, and we're getting better at that too. And it's not just the article thing too. And ultimately where we're going with this is question answering too. It's one thing to spit an article at you, but Mm -hmm. You think about like right now, if you take your browser and you go and say, what is the population of Tasmania? Yes, Google could spit you over to Wikipedia, but what it really does, it puts a little box at the top and it says the population of Tasmania is 500,000, whatever it is. So it does question answering and it basically extracts from an article 
hopefully a reliable source and gives you an answer straight up to your question. And that's where we're going with chatbots today. So that's something that's in pilot right now for looking stays. So yeah, that's where we're going. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. So my next question is based on everything that we just talked about, it's somewhat fair for some folks who are listening to say, oh my gosh, the AI is going to take away some jobs. That, that's what we're hearing. So for people who feel that AI is going to take over human jobs, how do you see people's day-to-day -day responsibilities at work shifting with the use of AI? Yeah, I mean, like any new technology, AI will both take away some types of jobs, some classes of jobs, and it will create some classes of jobs. And already we're seeing that. For example, here at Salesforce, there's a guy named Greg Bennett. And Greg Bennett is a conversation designer. This did not exist until five years ago, even the category, the job category of conversation designer. But we have them. Amazon is designing your conversations with your own Alexa, example, Google has them, and so on. These types of categories are starting to come into existence that we're not there before. Yeah, AI will remove some of the grunt work from your day. I talked about case classification, being able to learn to read your cases and stuff like that. And the fact that back in the day, Ring Central had all these people that were doing that. And hopefully what they will do now is actually providing support to the customer instead of just grunt work. But yeah, AI will have a tendency to take on more and more of this grunt work, of this repetitive stuff that we do a lot of searching, digging around and just like the stuff to, yeah. It's not generally the most fun job in the world. That's true. But it will create these whole new categories as well. To the point that you made earlier, pretty much any time new technology is introduced into society, we're faced with a similar dilemma or predicament where the fear is that, and many times it's very legitimate, where the technology is going to replace the need for people. We could say the same thing when the sewing machine came out, when the typewriter came out, when the word processor came out. And while at the same time, it's, yes, it could eliminate, or we, in some instances, it's absolutely not could. It's definitely going to eliminate some jobs, the more rudimentary, monotonous, mundane, boring kind of jobs. I think it gives a phenomenal opportunity for those same employees to upskill themselves and find another way to use some creativity and some more brain selectivity and do things that are more innately human to solve problems and contribute to society in different ways. And it could be something that is very closely related to whatever it was that they were doing before. Hopefully whatever it was that they were do doing before allowed them to become experts in that thing mm -hmm. where they can now just shift one step to the side and help manage it in a different way. Yeah, but beyond that, and going back to some of the misconceptions, not just about Einstein, but about AI in general. I mean, have you ever seen the movie Her? Yes. With uh, King Jax, Robert Johansson. If you haven't seen that movie, I strongly recommend it. We are not in the movie Her yet. For those of you who have not seen it, I will say that in the movie Her, you never actually see Scarlett Johansson. She is nothing more. She is an OS. And she is like an AI thing that rearranges all of Joaquin Phoenix's email and talks to him all night long and plays games with him and stuff like that. We are not there and we're not going to be there for a while, maybe in 2045, maybe. If you think about how AI actually manifests itself, it's much more elementary than that. Obviously there are manifestations in Salesforce. For those of you who are using Gmail, if you ever seen this autocomplete capability, the gray text that it does, that stuff is cool. And that type of machine learning did not exist before 2018. That's the craziest thing is that this just came into existence and now you see it every day. You use it all the time and you don't even think about it. It's on your phone too. iOS 15 now auto completes messages like that. What's also remarkable about that, by the way, is that in Gmail, it's responding with a similar tone to the yes. way you write. It's matching your tone. That's, That's true. Scary. And yet it's not writing the whole email for you. You always have to get it started and it does a pretty good job of predicting what you're going to say. But most of the stuff that it's predicting, if you think about it, is a little bit mundane, right? It's, hey, thank you. I look forward to meeting you or whatever. Right. You might always, right. you know, end email with something like that. And it'll auto complete that. And that's cool. But it's not like. It's ha somewhat uh, harmless. Right. right. It's not like, it's not like doing a whole thing. Hey, I'm free uh, Wednesday at 3.30 if you're free then. So let's, uh, let's coordinate that. That would be cool if it did that. Not there yet. Not there for a while. For as much as we're afraid that AI is going to take jobs or whatever, we have to remember that we're pretty far away from that right now still.
I'm with you. All right, so let me ask you this. Folks who are listening to this podcast and they are Salesforce professionals and now we've piqued their curiosity about Einstein and they want to start learning more in a way, again, from the perspective of the admin where they can start diving into it. I'm assuming that the word trailhead is about to come up, but where would you recommend that they start to dive in? What type of path do you think they should take so that they can start to become familiar and have some confidence where perhaps they can be an internal advocate within their own organization about exploring Einstein? All right. So trailhead.einstein.com is the only trail mix that has its own domain name, by the way. Love it. And so trailhead.einstein.com. So check that out. It's a big, giant, long trail mix with, I don't know, 26 trails on it because we have a lot of Einstein capabilities and it goes into them, but a lot of them are hands-off. So you can actually provision a developer edition organ. There's stuff we haven't even talked about yet. Like for example, Einstein prediction builder, recommendation builder, next best action. There's lots of these things that we have now that are really interesting. And for those of you who are Salesforce professionals, you can really get into Einstein pretty easily with something like case classification, which is nothing more than flipping a couple of boxes and turning it on or Einstein search. But if you really want to get into it, prediction builder, recommendation builder, next best action, Einstein discovery for the hardcore people, you could really do some interesting stuff. I got a point to recommendation builder, by the way, it is relatively new, came out this year, but it can recommend things, recommends X for Y. You can use it to recommend a product to a contact. You can use it to recommend, a lot of people are using it to recommend parts for work orders and field service. I didn't see this one coming, but what parts should I put on the truck? So, you know, if I'm going to roll the truck. So you can recommend any object for any object in Salesforce, basically, as long as they're linked by a, a junction object. And that's available today. So anyway, my point is, as an administrator, there are these kind of pre-built applications like lead scoring and opportunity scoring, like case classification, that are not using pre-built models. We'll, underneath the scenes, build a special machine learning model for you. But they're super simple and just check boxes to turn them on. And then there are these things like prediction builder, recommendation builder, next best action that require a little more brain power on your part to be like, how am I going to apply this to my organization? What can I do with this? Now, Prediction Builder, by the way, is freemium right now. So you can use that. So is Next Best Action for that matter. And I think Recommendation Builder will be soon. So uh, you can even use these today in your sandboxes or whatever, provided there's data there. Remember, there has to be that. Otherwise, it will totally puke. You can you can use Prediction Builder on a full copy sandbox, for example. That, that'll work fine. But there has yep. to be data for it to chew on for you to understand if it's going to work. Anyway, so trailhead.einstein.com. You can get hands-on with these things. You can try them. But like I said, a lot of these capabilities are available now today in the orgs that you are managing, that you're administering, that you can make yourself a full copy sandbox. You can turn these things on and try them out and see how they work on the real data. Recently refreshed full copy sandbox, mind you. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about Einstein in Marketing Cloud because it is very heavily used among our customers. And the thing is that mm -hmm. the thing about Marketing Cloud is that even a small business tends to have a lot of data in Marketing Cloud just by virtue of what it is. If you have 100,000 email addresses that you're emailing, almost instantly generate reams of data that is absolutely fertile ground for something like Einstein to work. And so in Marketing Cloud, there are like 10 different Einstein capabilities. There's like engagement scoring, which is like, if I send you an email, are you going to open it or not? Remember I said earlier, every prediction is underlied by a question. And so then you can, instead of just sending you have your new email campaign. You're going to send uh, about women's pants. Instead of just sending it to all women over 35 in New York, you can say women over 35 in New York who are most likely to open an email from me. And just like that improves your open rate significantly because you're just not sending emails to people who are not going to open in the first place. But you can also use things like send time optimization. So maybe for you, it's better if I send this email at 1 p.m. But for me, it's better if they send it at 5 p.m. or whatever. And so it actually comes up with a predictive time that it will send each person and each person could get it at a different time based on when they're most likely to actually look at the thing. So Einstein there in marketing cloud, also the one in commerce cloud, is a product recommendations and things like that. Mm -hmm. These are not to be ignored and they are very heavily used. So again, if you're using any of these things, sales cloud, service cloud, marketing cloud, commerce cloud, each one of them has an Einstein. Most of them are included in some fashion in the base licenses. You can try it out, kick the tires, try it. It's pretty cool. And then try the builders, try prediction builder, recommendation builder, next best action. Cause that's the next level stuff where you can really start using your noodle and bringing some in interesting machine learning to the game. Amazing. I love it. Is it safe to say that 
every Salesforce professional should at the very least start getting comfortable with Einstein, even if their organization is not using it today from a, just from a career trajectory perspective. Now is definitely the time. Now is the time to get to know Einstein. And if you do have questions about it, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, I am very active on the discussion boards, the trailblazer discussion boards and the partner boards, uh, and both of them have an area called it's star Salesforce Einstein star. I don't know why there are stars around it, but there are like asterisks. So if you ask a question on there, either I or one of my colleagues here will catch it and we will answer it. And we do answer these things pretty quickly. So if you have questions about Einstein, please feel free to ask on the trailblazer success boards, but we will answer. Beautiful. Marco, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights and your wisdom and some of the magic of Einstein keep trailblazing. Thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time to listen through to the end of this episode of The Brainy Age Show. We value you and hope that this episode will help you in your career. If you like this episode, please share it with your fellow trailblazers in the Salesforce community. What's the expression? They say sharing is caring. Visit brainy8.show to check out the show notes for this episode, where you'll discover more about any of the themes or resources discussed in it. Finally, don't forget to rate and review this episode on your favorite podcast app so that others can find it more easily. Until next time, bye-bye.